Okay, Einstein has taken us in 1619 to the banks of Lake Tenochtitlan in the site of modern day Mexico City. And this has been another siege, another siege of, of Mexico where with 600 men, Cortez, a few horses, 600 men, and a weapon that he didn't know he had destroyed an entire civilization and almost wiped it off of the face of the earth. So what was that secret weapon? A weapon that Cortez himself did not understand that he had. Well, the Europeans had developed a homeostasis or a, a balance with diseases like smallpox. They carried them with them, but, and so they were infected with them but it wasn't necessarily killing them off, but the natives, the persons, the Mexicans, the Aztecs, had no such immunity. And smallpox swept ahead of this very tiny Mexican group of soldiers as they approached Mexico City and wiped out most of the army, all of the nobles, all of the leaders of the Aztec nation, and subsequently, the Spaniards were able to decimate the population, not by their guns and steel and weapons, but by smallpox. That was the secret weapon. And this same scenario was repeated several years later in Peru, the site of Cusco, when Pizarro, uh, uh, attacked Atahualpa, the Incan emperor, and the same scenario was repeated. So a novel infectious disease in a population that had no history of exposure to that is devastating. Two large cultures wiped off the face of the earth. So remember the devastation that smallpox brought to both Peru and Mexico so let's fast forward now, and Einstein is gonna take us outside of London, 1796, to the offices of British physician Edward Jenner. Now, immunizations has been the greatest weapon that public health has had in the fight against infectious disease, and it all started right here. So Jenner, being very bright, noticed that in and around London, milkmaids who commonly work with dairy cattle in the, the business of milking cows, and these dairy cattle carried cowpox. Remember the disease that jumped over to humans forming smallpox? The dairy cattle had cowpox. These small pustules that existed on their udders and across their body, underside of their body, the milkmaids came into contact of this, were infected by cowpox, but Jenner noted they never got smallpox. And an idea came to him. So why not take some of this fluid from the cowpox, inject some human subjects, which we wouldn't do today, but he could do it back then, inject these human subjects with the fluid from the cowpox and see what happened. Well, they got mildly ill, but they never developed smallpox. So the smallpox vaccine was created, and the whole idea, the concept of vaccines emerged. Again, the major tool in our fight against infectious disease. So recall Dr. Addy's Broad Street Pump. So we're 1854 in the Soho District of London in England, and people are dying of cholera. So what causes diseases like cholera? At the time, no one knew, but there were many theories. The first theory was that it was a sort of a miasma, an atmospheric disruption. No one knew what caused it, but that it was breathing this bad air that caused these diseases. Well, in fact, uh, London was a filthy city. Uh, human waste was dumped into the rivers 
uh, actually dumped outside of buildings and apartments and where people lived into the streets. There was all sorts of animal waste and human waste all about and it easily could get into the water supply, which is what happened in 1854 in this Soho district of London. Now, an English physician, John Snow, noticed that there was a particular pattern in these diseases, this cholera victims. And he began to, with the help of a minister, identify where these victims lived and he mapped it out and he discovered that they lived in very close proximity to this Broad Street pump. And previously, John Snow, who's now known as the father of epidemiology, had had a theory that what causes these infectious diseases is not a miasma at all, but that there is a cause that is found in microparasites. But he had no proof. Uh, the microscopes at the time were very rudimentary and he could not see these small uh, microscopes, these microbes that existed out there. But his theory was it wasn't miasma, it was drinking the water that came from this particular pump and that that's what caused the cases of cholera. So he mapped it out and he was able to convince the local authorities to let him remove the handle of this pump and the outbreak of cholera dispersed and went away. So Hamburg, Germany, Paris, France, Edinburgh, Scotland, what do they have in common? Well these were the sites of monumental changes that brought about huge improvements, world-changing improvements in public health, medicine, and surgery. First, Koch and Pasteur, uh, Koch from Germany, Pasteur from France, sort of worked concurrently on the same idea on the germ theory to identify the exact animals the microparasites that cause specific diseases and developed a way of proving that these, that these diseases were caused by these specific organisms. And each different disease, they were able to prove it had a specific organism and they developed a scientific method to irrefutably prove this. So they revolutionized public health kicked off the golden age of public health. If you remember Rosling's video, all of a sudden, health dramatically improved in the European nations because of Koch and Pasteur. Now, over in Scotland, a Scottish surgeon, Lister, Joseph Lister, was very interested in the work of Pasteur, and he was thinking that he was a great surgeon, but half of his patients died of gangrene and other infections. And what if he incorporated the ideas of Pasteur? And he did so by swabbing a solution, a weak solution of carbolic acid on his instruments, on the surgical area, and on the wound itself. And instead of half of his victims, of his patients dying of, of uh, infectious disease and gangrene, almost all of them lived, revolutionized hospital care forever. So changes, monumental changes in public health, in medicine, and in surgery just changed the world forever. Three of the greatest scientists ever to live. So our next topic is the social determinants of health. And I can't think of any better topic to bridge from infectious disease to the social determinants than something that happened right here in South Carolina, the discovery of the cause of pellagra that, that was a scourge of the South around 1920s. So there are videos out on Blackboard, watch that, learn about pellagra, and we'll be talking about that, that disease and how it really 
was the first research on the social determinants. We'll talk about that in our next segment. So we're beginning a transition at this point in the history of public health. We're beginning to transition away from infectious disease toward a more chronic disease caused by social problems. But, and I caution you, don't forget infectious disease. Remember the cause, the underlying cause of epidemics is when a novel disease maybe jumps from, from animals, maybe mutates, or maybe, maybe even a bioterrorist event, a, di a disease that we no longer think about or worry about or have any immunity for, jumps into a human population that has no exposure. Think about that danger. Now let's move on. Thanks for being with me in this trip across four million years. Now we're entering another segment.